Every hero's proper function is to provide a noble image for men to be inspired and guided by in their own actions. The gods set ideals, heroes enact them, and artists preserve the image as a guide for men. Real art creates myths a society can live instead of die by, and clearly our society is in need of such myths. Mountains of unspeakable books, paintings, symphonies, and so on have been dumped on long-suffering humanity in recent years because mediocre critics have wrongly claimed for them astute perceptions on the problems of, for instance, blacks and women. We need to stop excusing mediocre and downright pernicious art. Stop taking it for what it's worth as we take our fast foods, our overpriced cars that are no good, the overpriced houses we spend all our lives fixing, our television programs, our schools thrown up like barricades in the way of young minds, our brainless fat religions, our poisonous air, our incredible cult of sports, and our ritual of fornicating with all pretty or even coarse-faced strangers. John Gardner, Moral Fiction, published 1978. What is fiction for? If fiction, be it in the form of a book, a movie, a song, a poem, a sculpture, a painting, whatever, inherently has some moral quality to it, what should it be doing? How should fiction go about its work? What should that moral quality be? If we're going to talk about what fiction is morally for, it means we also have to talk about what fiction is doing in general, why we have fiction at all, and how fiction works. We started down that road last episode. But you know, I was wondering if anyone has talked about these questions before, and you know what? It turns out a lot of white dude bros have. <laughs> Who'd have thunk it? So today we're going to go down the rabbit hole of history. How have uh, mostly white dude bro thinkers through Western history pontificated about the question of fiction's moral purposes? Stick around, and I promise you the best take is actually from a woman, because, of course. <laughs> Who'd have thunk it? I'm Jed Cole, and you are Inside the Text. Chapter 1. First and foremost, the character should be good. To answer questions about fiction's moral purposes, the Greek philosopher Aristotle figured we should start with what fiction does at its most basic level, and his answer to that question has been very influential in Western literary thought ever since. For Aristotle, all art, including fiction, is at core representation, or in Greek, mimesis. It's where we get the English word mimic and mime. Aristotle says, that mimesis is something we all do, whether we're learning a new skill or trying to remember stuff in our minds. But fiction is a particular kind of representation. For Aristotle, the purpose of fiction is to represent characters, sufferings, and actions, and this is done through plot, characters, and speech, whether it be verse or prose, that demonstrates something or makes some general statement about the world. This reflects his privileging of Greek, fiction, which included poetic verse and drama, and he gets more specific about that. For Aristotle, fiction is basically boiled down to two genres, tragedy and comedy, and these have different political and moral qualities to them. Tragedy, for Aristotle, should be, quote, morally satisfying, involving characters who are superior in virtue and justice than, you know, normal folks. These characters should elicit dread or compassion in us. Comedy, on the other hand, represents people who are inferior in virtue um, relative to normal folks because um, laughter is an aspect of what is ugly rather than what is noble. Okay. There's obviously a moral and political aspect to both of these definitions, but for Aristotle, tragedy is explicitly moral. He says that, quote, first and foremost, the characters should be good, end quote. 
elaborating that a good character doesn't even need to be just a dude because a good character can exist in every class, for a woman can be good, and a slave can, although the first of these may be inferior and the second wholly worthless. Um, yeah, so Aristotle also says characters should be consistent and true to life and also appropriate. Uh, like, you know. There is a type of manly valor, but valor in a woman, or unscrupulous cleverness, is inappropriate. Uh, wait a second. While it sounds at the beginning of his treatise like Aristotle saying that fiction imitates objective reality, or capital N, nature, by the end here, Aristotle's talking about how different genres of fiction should produce certain kinds of moral satisfaction and emotional progression in the audience. Maybe reality, or nature, isn't what fiction imitates. As we heard Terry Eagleton put this in last episode, quote, Fictive texts are moral statements not because they launch stringent judgments according to some code, but because they deal in human values, meanings, and purposes. End quote. To put things differently, what if fiction has as much to do with the representation of what certain characters slash sufferings slash decisions mean as it does with representing these things in general? Chapter 2. Winning the Mind from Wickedness to Virtue Fast forward to 1580s England. Sir Philip Sidney writes an apology for poesy, where he takes on general objections to fiction's usefulness and defends its moral worth. Now, Sidney agrees wholeheartedly with Aristotle when he says that fiction is an art of imitation, or mimesis, that both teaches and delights, quote-unquote. But contrary to Aristotle, Sidney argues that non-fictional works, think history and philosophy, which ostend to really talk about things in capital and nature, or quote-unquote, the real world, are also mimetic, representational. See, they're all trying to represent something that is or was, in the case of history, but Sidney says fiction is superior because it represents not just what is, but quote, what may be and should be. That said, Sidney thinks there are right and wrong ways to use poesy or fiction. Comedy, for example, might represent or depict, quote, the common errors of life and the filthiness of evil, unquote, but if it doesn't somehow persuade the audience to avoid the one and repent of the other, then you're doing it wrong, bro. Because fiction is all about, quote, winning the mind from wickedness to virtue. An important piece of all this for Sidney, and maybe another difference from Aristotle, is the idea that fiction doesn't make truth claims. He says this because some of his contemporaries thought fiction was lesser than nonfiction on account of the fact that it lies about everything. It's all made up. Well, actually, Sidney says, quote, for the poet, he nothing affirms, and therefore never lieth. For as I take it, to lie is to affirm that to be true which is false. So as the other artists, and especially the historian, affirming many things, can in the cloudy knowledge of mankind hardly escape from many lies. But the poet never affirmeth. The poet never maketh any circles about your imagination to conjure you to believe for true what he writes. By looking at both fiction and nonfiction together as mimetic arts, Sidney can say that while non-fictive works like history are prone to errors because they're trying to be objective, fictive works avoid the risk of inaccuracy altogether because they don't imitate things we can fact-check, and if they do, that's just not the point anyway. But we come away from Sidney's clever clapback with something of a conundrum. If fiction is neither true nor false, how is it so useful for teaching virtue, as he claims? How do we get from fiction to reality? From a made-up character 
to me going and doing good or bad things out in the world. If fiction represents what could be or what should be, how do I know a particular fictional vision is, I don't know, accurate, appropriate? I mean, what do I compare it to? We'll come back to that later because for the next little while in history, everyone just kind of assumes it works out anyway. Interlude number one. Welcome to capitalism, my children, where the duty of a good Protestant Christian is to work as hard and as smart as you can without showing any signs of greediness, and one of the best ways to do that is to be the owner of capital, showing God in your fruits that you're working your very best to fulfill your calling, objectively, methodically, and dispassionately tweaking your business for a profitable outcome, not for the money, but so as not to despise the good blessings God has so arbitrarily, yet by his most manly grace, given you. And if you be not blessed by grace with the means or wherewithal to own the means of production for the glory of God, then live out your calling as a humble soul, striving for the best use of your talents, not seeking after riches and never complaining against the requirement of the bosses, but rather in humility, working faithfully for God's glory after the manner of the apostles, though your wealth be next to nothing. Abstain from all sin of selfishness, but ask God for a work ethic worthy of your calling. Amen. Chapter 3. Keeping the Proles in Line The year is 1750, and Samuel Johnson, poet, essayist, dictionary writer, and committed Tory, is at it again. You open up today's copy of The Rambler, Johnson's commentary magazine, and what do you know? He's talking about how fiction is changing for the worse. The works of fiction, with which the present generation seems more particularly delighted, are such as exhibit life in its true state, diversified only by accidents that daily happen in the world, and influenced by passions and qualities which are really to be found in conversing with mankind. Now what Johnson is worried about is the recent shift in popular literature away from fantastical tales along the lines of Aristotle's definition of tragedy, where the characters and events are all beyond the common person's realm of possibility. No, no, what's in vogue now is realism. And the problem with that, for Johnson, is, well, millennials. These books are written chiefly to the young, the ignorant, and the idle, to whom they serve as lectures of conduct, and introductions into life. They are the entertainment of minds unfurnished with ideas, and therefore easily susceptible of impressions, not fixed by principles, and therefore easily following the current of fancy, not informed by experience, and consequently open to every false suggestion and partial account. Uh, okay, Boomer. So Johnson is very worried that fiction isn't taking to heart the cultural wisdom that writers should take care not to set before the quote-unquote young, ignorant, and idle any unjust prejudices, perverse opinions, and incongruous combinations of images. But why? Well, back when we commoners entertained ourselves with stories about characters beyond our rank, you know, knights in shining armor, tragic heroes like Achilles and whatnot, we didn't bother seeing them as models for ourselves. But according to Johnson, in realist stories... When an adventurer is leveled with the rest of the world, and acts in such scenes of the universal drama as may be the lot of any other man, young spectators fix their eyes upon him with closer attention, and hope by observing his behavior and success to regulate their own practices, when they shall be engaged in the like part. The problem with realism is that characters aren't unambiguously good or bad. What's the rabble going to take away from that? Johnson's argument is that fiction has a moral responsibility. He writes, it is justly considered as the greatest excellency of art, to imitate nature, 
but it is necessary to distinguish those parts of nature which are most proper for imitation. Greater care is still required in representing life, which is so often discolored by passion or deformed by wickedness. So the purpose of fiction isn't to represent how human life really is, but to represent how life ought to be. To lead readers into virtue, particularly preserving youth's innocence and eschewing the wish for superiority, things realist fiction doesn't seem to care about. You can probably see that this kind of moralization of fiction has a political bent to it, despite what we may think about the virtues of innocence and humility. Johnson is writing in the interest of a capital-owning class on the rise, worried by fiction's supposed potential for corrupting the next generation of business leaders and exploited workers alike. A century later, the critic Matthew Arnold writing in the environment of a much more developed industrial capitalist environment, with a firmly entrenched middle class gaining increasing political clout, brought the analysis of culture to a more explicitly political and um, spiritual level in his book, Culture and Anarchy. Arnold thinks capital C culture, which would include fiction, is a national enterprise of striving for human perfection by which he means social harmony, not to be found in ideal circumstances, but rather in, quote, an inward condition of the mind and spirit. Basically, we need culture in order to cohere as a political and national body across classes. But, you know, classes themselves are great. I mean, just look at lobsters. If we didn't have classes, it'd be anarchy. <clears throat> the real problem is that the middle class is too philistine and needs more culture, you know, like the aristocrats used to have in order to be taken seriously and make sure that the nation's tone of feeling and grandeur of spirit, quote-unquote, don't get dull or something. Also, if the Philistines can just get a hold of cultural authority, then they can properly teach and enculturate the proletariat underneath them so that instead of striking or being miserable, they'll have a shared ideology. Uh, sorry, I meant a culture of sweetness and light. For Arnold, Culture, of which fiction is a part, is a political, even a semi-spiritual affair. The very framework and exterior order of the state is sacred, and culture is the most resolute enemy of anarchy, because of the great hopes and designs for the state which culture teaches us to nourish. And more urgently, Arnold elsewhere says that if the middle class can't win the proletariat sympathies, or find the ability to direct it with cultural authority, then anarchy will be the result. Hmm, I wonder why he thinks that. Interlude number two. What follows is a paraphrase of some passages in Terry Eagleton's book, Ideology. <clears throat> the thing about ideology, or what some have called false consciousness, is that a lot of people get confused between false as something that's untrue to what is really the case, and false as unreal. Because there is a difference. Works of fiction are one example. Lots of fictions contain empirical statements like, there's a lot of snow in Greenland, or human beings usually have two ears, no more and no less. But these statements aren't there in the fiction to stand as empirical statements, but rather as struts or scaffolds for the worldview of the text itself. And the fact that they're there to support that worldview determines what sorts of statements come up in the first place, and how they're used. In this kind of situation, language that's usually just used to state a fact about something in the world is put to use for performative ends. Truths are organized with the goal of persuading the reader that there are, for example, really such things as good and evil, or that the light and dark sides of the Force represent these two poles with people like Luke Skywalker fitting the good and Darth Vader fitting the evil. You can't test ideology. You can't go to a lab and falsify a way of seeing that applies symbols, narratives, knowledges, and facts that amount to producing and reproducing the idea that, say, capitalism is ultimately the best and only possible kind of world we can hope to imagine. And likewise, you can't falsify the worldview of, say, Star Wars. We suspend our disbelief, as the saying goes, and examine the work's way of seeing 
on its own terms, as a symbolic expression of a certain way of living out the world. Nevertheless, we readers don't always just accept the worldview of a text on its own terms. We often want to say that it doesn't make sense, or that it's an oversimplifying or dramatically biased way of seeing. And so, maybe a way of seeing an ideology, which is what fiction articulates, is after all vulnerable, here little and there little, to judgments of truth and falsehood. But a worldview isn't just the perception of certain things, it is also marked by a sort of style of perception, which is much harder to judge as true or false. Chapter 4. To represent and illustrate the past. So, all the theories we've seen so far have sort of assumed that fiction is there to teach us something, namely virtue. But do people pick up Harry Potter to learn what it is to be a good person, or do they just want to see what happens next? In his book Philosophy of Literature, Peter Lamarck points out that except for children's books, people usually respond poorly to preachy narratives, stories that are too didactic, Stories that are clearly trying to convey a message. Cough. Atlas shrugged. Cough. Lamarck argues, Readers are not commonly motivated to read literary works by the thought that they will learn something. Rather, they seek a distinctive kind of pleasure from their reading. The very process of reading a novel or a poem is unlike that conventionally associated with philosophical or historical works. So what we have, Lamarck says, is a vast array of fiction that's actually chock full of what he calls moral content, but it doesn't follow that fiction is therefore aiming at moral education, or that we should only value literary works to the extent that they contain quote-unquote lessons. Keeping this argument in mind, let's circle back to the issue of realism we were talking about earlier. Henry James, who was writing novels and short stories while our buddy Matthew Arnold was still kicking, would have probably agreed with Lamarck, more or less. In opposition to the likes of quite dead by this point Samuel Johnson, Henry James thought fiction should be realistic, making a case for it in his essay, The Art of Fiction. Whereas folks may be used to admiring, say, paintings for their realism and true-to-lifeness, lots of people in James's day, and in ours for that matter, thought that fiction, as mere make-believe, should, you know, stay in its lane. He observes that the spirit of an old attitude toward fiction as being wicked at worst and trifling at best lives on in a quite oblique regard directed toward any story which doesn't more or less admit that it's pretty much just a joke. But James argues that fiction should be allowed to quote-unquote compete with life in the same way that painting, sculpture, and historiography do. Both the historian and the novelist, he says, set out quote, to represent and illustrate the past, the actions of men, that is, people. And as we said in the last episode, historiography is morally concerned in the same way art is. James acknowledges this in his argument for realistic fiction. To apologize for writing realistic fiction, he says, implies that the novelist is less occupied in looking for the truth than the historian. And this search for truth that works itself out through make-believe is, for James, what realism in art is partly about. Being true to life is an aesthetic as well as a moral quality, wouldn't you say? It's equally appropriate to judge plausible or implausible a description of a fictional metro line or the character of a villain. I think we can see James's debate play out today as well in different forms. The remark that it's just a movie or it's just a game or it's just a story are used all the time to refute those who read stories seriously as being representations through metaphor of what is real or true, quote-unquote. Of course, those who say such things in order to refute the moral judgments of others, say, to dismiss Anita Sarkeesian's criticisms of sexism in video games, turn around and use their own moral reasoning when the terms change, say, when Star Wars features black and female leads. 
those who take stories seriously, recognize that the realism of fiction doesn't make it any less politically or morally significant. Quite the contrary, it would seem. Chapter 5. Does fiction influence our morals? Or, fascists read fiction too. During his presidential campaign, Donald Trump told Michael Wolff of The Hollywood Reporter that he was rereading one of his favorite books, All Quiet on the Western Front. The 1929 novel is about German soldiers questioning the validity of warfare and violence given our common humanity. It hasn't stopped Trump from rounding up and caging thousands of refugees and migrants from Latin America or saying things like, I'm gonna bomb the shit out of them. It's true. I don't care. I don't care. They've gotta be stopped. Researcher Timothy W. Ryback says that Adolf Hitler had a library with some 16,000 books. Hitler thought Don Quixote, Robinson Crusoe, Uncle Tom's Cabin, and Gulliver's Travels were among the great works of the world's literature. He read voraciously, apparently. And yet, literature didn't stop him from leading book burnings, overseeing a genocide of Jewish and other marginalized people, and a host of other evils. What am I saying? I'm saying fascists read literature as well as people we'd usually call good, and vice versa. The great swath of average folks who may not have had access to so-called capital L literature aren't particularly immoral or imaginatively bankrupt, to use a phrase of Eagleton's. So where does that leave us when we think about the moral function of fiction? Well, I think it means that any theory of fiction's moral function that says it inherently influences the reader's morals is probably missing something critical because it doesn't take account of all the facts. And yet, one of the most common assumptions about the theories of fiction we've seen so far assumes that fiction conveys moral information and leads the reader to take up or put down moral views. I'm just not sure if that's how life works. I like how novelist Mary Gordon puts it in an essay she wrote on moral fiction. At best, she says, fiction never shapes people in orderly or predictable ways. That's because she says, quote, fiction's moral element, while precious, is only ever contextual and provisional. Stories are as good at complicating morality as simplifying it. Chapter 6. Morality and Chaos For the opening of this episode, I read a bit from novelist John Gardner's polemical book on moral fiction, which is like a paradigm of conservative dude-bro takes on the subject in our postmodern era. Written in the late 1970s, this book takes past thought about the moral function of fiction, some of which I've just reviewed, and ratchets it up to about 11. Hating on fiction and literary criticism about the concerns of black people, women, and by extension, all other marginalized groups, Gardner thinks that all that stuff gets away from the real, shall we say, archetypal myths that he thinks order society and keep chaos at bay. For a more recent example of this kind of thought, see Jordan Peterson. The crux of this attitude is summed up when Gardner says, We would not put up with a debauched king, but in a democracy all of us are kings, and we praise debauchery as pluralism. This book is of course no condemnation of pluralism, but it is true that art is in one sense fascistic, it claims, on good authority, that some things are healthy for individuals and society and some things are not. Uh, yeah. So a couple things stand out here. One, Gardner thinks that bad fiction fails in some way to make moral distinctions. It's like he's saying, fiction nowadays is all relativistic, Meh. which is like, what? No? But note also how he's like, yeah, a little fascism is good because, you know, good and evil are a thing. For Gardner, moral judgment necessarily entails symbolic violence. And if you can't handle it, then you just need to man up because that's just the way it is, boy. The great majority of stories out there are drivel and don't deserve to be taken seriously. And if you do, you're doing something reprehensible. You know, like taking part in the downfall of white supremacy. I mean, uh, civilization. 
but there's a better take, you guys. And guess what? It's not from a dude. In her essay, At the Same Time, The Novelist and Moral Reasoning, Susan Sontag defines the problem over which Gardner loses his lunch, and that problem is the problem of simultaneity. Everything is always happening at the same time as everything else. This is the world we live in, one that's infinitely extended through space and time. It's too much to really understand if you think about it. So, Sontag says that fiction applies a sort of stipulated shortening of that simultaneous and infinite existence into a linear narrative with definite causes and effects. Not only is fiction a narrowing of existence, it also shortens it in time. Stories have endings that, unlike in real life, allow us to, quote, come to a full stop that is not death and discover exactly where we are, end quote. Language itself works this way too, by its very structure, which is why narrative and language are inseparable. But here's the thing, the fact that existence extends in all directions, infinitely, the fact that there are other people out there existing all at the same time, means that there are always competing moral claims being made on us. That's a problem for us thinking meatbags, we just can't deal with everything. So what do we deal with? Now Gardner thinks the solution is rallying around so-called archetypal myths that he describes as being quote-unquote healthy for quote-unquote civilization, myths that people can emulate in order to keep quote-unquote chaos at bay. But to do so, he's okay with, you know, a little fascism. Sontag agrees that the process of fiction is a process of paying attention, and therefore is a moral process. That is, if you're paying attention to some things, you're not paying attention to others, and that implies that some things are better than others. But, whereas Gardner is like, we need to get back to paying attention to these good old stories and relegate all these others to oblivion, Sontag looks at it like this. The best fiction doesn't cut off our consciousness or narrow it down. On the contrary, it deepens it. And even though fiction is a morally charged process of paying attention, and even though stories have endings that imply the exclusion of all other stories, there's always a trace left behind of what's been excluded, what could have been. And it's at this point that for Sontag, the moral function of the best fiction has to do with the humility that comes from recognizing, as she puts it, the sheer incapacity of our moral understanding to take in the vast simultaneity of existence. Because human beings tend to forget that overwhelming fact that everything is happening at once, with all the moral implications that come with that. Sontag says that the ethical task of fiction is therefore to stretch our world and deepen, as well as oppose ideologies that want to keep the world narrow and unsympathetic. Ooh, this has been a lot, but I still have questions. Like, all these theorists talk about what good fiction does, but what about all the other fiction out there? And we still haven't accounted for the fact that fiction doesn't have a predictable effect on moral behavior, so we still need to think about what the upshot of fiction is. Why is it so morally important for so many of us? I'll try to think about that in next episode. You've been listening to Inside the Text. You can find this podcast on your favorite podcatcher or by going to insidethetext.wordpress.com. If you have questions or requests for future episodes, scroll down on the homepage and leave a note. Intro music by Jad Cole. Other music by JL Brock44, Kevin McLeod, and Visager. Links to their music in the show notes. Be excellent to each other, and peace be with you.